So Courtney, I always like to kind of set the stage and just give a big picture view of where we are in the ESG landscape. At this point, what is the current landscape? Give us a snapshot of what we're seeing right now and also in terms of growth and other trends you're seeing. It's a great question and always a great place to start. Some of the global numbers that we follow are the latest global overall stats as of the year end 2020 show that the sustainable investing market is at about $35 trillion globally of professional assets under management. This is really the broadest definition of sustainable assets. And so it covers a number of strategies, which, which we can talk about, but that's a large number to start with. And I think gives a sense of the scope. A latest study that we've seen from, from Bloomberg Intelligence projects that will reach 50 trillion in sustainable assets under management, which will be roughly a third of overall AUM by 2025. So we continue to see this growth. Behind this, and we can get into more of these drivers, but we're seeing um, continued growth and, and flows into ESG strategies, even amidst the current volatility in the market post COVID and the current war in Russia and Ukraine and the energy crisis that we're seeing unfold. But latest Morgan Stanley research shows still flows into ESG funds has been outpacing the broader market. And so it continues to be an area that we're seeing interest in among, among investors globally and among our clients as well. So hopefully that's a helpful overview of, of where we're at in the market overall. It is. It is. I'm actually surprised by some of those numbers, especially the projection. When you say we're at 35 trillion AUM right now, uh, what were we at five, 10 years ago? I don't know if you have those uh, figures at your fingertips, but just for me to understand the growth. It's a great question. And the Global Sustainable Investment Alliance is a great source that has those numbers going back you know, five, 10 years from when we first started tracking, uh, you know, ESG or sustainable assets globally. I think we've seen the most growth. Um, historically, it's been out in front in Europe where we've seen the largest corpus of dollars interested in sustainable investing, but we've seen um, even higher rates of growth, albeit off of a smaller base, particularly in the US and also more recently out of Asia as well. Uh, so the percentage growth figures really vary if you dig in by region, um, but it, it, we have seen market growth over the last even five, 10 years. Uh, in this space globally. And of course, Morgan Stanley's been focused on sustainable investing for well over a decade now. So you've really seen a lot of these different changes. We've talked about the growth. What are the challenges? How are they evolving over when we really first started to see this take off to where we are now? It's a really great question and one that keeps us going and, and focuses a lot of our work. I would say 10 years ago, we were launching our first dedicated and, and Wall Street's first dedicated platform within our wealth management division called Investing with Impact. It was really driven by the interest of our clients, particularly individuals and families and institutions who cared about aligning their investments with their values and their impact goals. So we launched that as a largely untested idea 10 years ago. We celebrated the 10-year anniversary this year with 70 billion in client assets on our wealth management platform dedicated to impact. And so I, that continued client interest is what really is driving our focus, which we've seen expand globally to institutional investors, as well as the corporates and the government uh, clients that we work with globally. I would say that some of the challenges and, and what I see as also opportunities in this space is the growing array of interests that underpin ESG and sustainable investing. I think we often hear it talked about as kind of a monolithic concept, but really underpinning that when we sit down with clients is a deep interest in specific themes, whether that's climate change and particularly within climate, whether that's trying to achieve net zero or to invest in the next generation of climate solutions, whether that's natural capital and biodiversity, the circular economy, reducing waste, and of course, inclusion and, and social issues are really rising to the forefront of many of our client conversations, many of the solutions we're providing. So it's being able to provide that nuance, being able to provide the data and the transparency that underpins those strategies and, and approaching all of these with authenticity. And we're seeing you know, globally evolving standards and regulations across all of this as well. So really seeking to navigate those as clearly as possible for our clients and as a global financial services firm and ensuring that that we're addressing this, you know, in the most authentic way for our clients, I think are some of the, the big opportunities um, as we see this, uh, this unfolding.
Um, I guess while we're waiting for uh, for Rhonda's to unfreeze, I guess I'll just add a couple of other comments as, as we see, I think some of the really unique um, opportunities for our client base um, really it are across multiple themes as I was describing. I think the, the natural capital and, and um, the ability to provide solutions both across the public markets and the private markets are really interesting um, areas of evolution for, for our clients uh, as we see it. And, and also the data challenge, um, which we also see as an opportunity. Again, I think uh, providing decision useful data across environmental, social and governance factors for our clients, whether they're looking at, uh, you know, publicly listed companies or private markets opportunities um, is really a key opportunity for us uh, as an organization. Um, also defining the, the full range of, of options that, again, are really of interest to our clients um, as we think about the, the big goals that we've set um, for ourselves, too. I'll maybe pause and see if Rhonda's back. If not, I can go on to a couple of other points uh, that might be interesting. Um, while we're waiting, I see a couple of questions coming in, I think, as we think about asset classes and uh, of interest to our clients. I would say this really runs, runs the full gamut, um, both on the public markets and the private market side. We see a lot of innovations happening, um, you know, data-driven solutions on, on the public equities market, uh, as well as in the fixed income space as well. We're seeing a lot more strategies come to market, um, particularly in the private markets, um, also within within. Um, uh, whether that's private equity, real estate, and, and hedge funds as well. So we see clients really seeking to integrate their impact goals and their ESG considerations across an entire portfolio, uh, particularly as we think about our wealth management client base. And so ensuring that our solution set is holistic and meets our clients' unique needs. Do we have you back? I, 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 I think I'm creating, creating some issues, issues here. here. Not all. You were doing well, Courtney. Keep going. All right. Um, let's see. I think questions that I'll just jump in and answer that, that we had talked about previously, Rhonda, was I think what we're seeing as far as growth from some of the younger investors that we see in the market, whether those are our clients or, or actors in the market uh, broadly. Um, a really interesting stat I, I thought I'd share with the group there is that we did an interesting survey out of our Institute for Sustainable Investing just last year, and we've seen continued growth and in interest for sustainable investing among millennial uh, among millennials, um, really capping out well over 90% of individual investors, which there's not much more to go when we think about that audience. Um, and so we see that the interest among millennials is, is much higher than some of the older generations. Um, and it's it's translating beyond investments also to other decisions that, that we see the millennial and the Gen Z demographics taking. We've seen really interesting surveys around where younger employees seek to work. Uh, I, a, a great survey from Cone Communications found that 64% of millennials will opt not to work for um, will opt not to work for an organization if they don't see a strong CSR policy or corporate social responsibility. Um, we're also seeing really interesting results out of our own. You know, some, we do an annual survey of our own summer um, associates and analysts here at Morgan Stanley, and we find the interest in sustainability in the corporate environment to to be really of interest. And so in addition to our own clients, I would say employees are another huge driver of sustainable finance um, for us within the financial services market. And I would imagine for many of our, our peer firms as well. Um, and I would say that's really translating into a few key long-term trends. I think uh, three that I had mentioned, one is that sustainability is really becoming table stakes from an employee perspective, um, as well as from understanding investment options. I think this next generation, whether they're investing for themselves, choosing their employer, or leading a firm, whether that's a financial services firm or a firm in any sector, I think an understanding of ESG issues is just becoming table stakes and, and the lingua franca uh, that we're seeing ac across the globe. We're Courtney, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Uh, hello. I apologize. Between the audio issues earlier, and I'm not really sure what is happening, but I could hear you the whole time, and you were giving a great summary of um, what is happening. While you were speaking, we had quite a few questions come into chat. Um, so I'm not sure if you're able to get a look at them, but let me just run a few by there, uh, by you, so you can have a sense of what's on people's minds. Question from James. What is the firm's view on the recent pressure on ESG investing in general, uh, questioning of fiduciary's use of ESG factors in investing, for instance? 
Yeah, I think the that's a really great question and one that we've we've navigated really since the beginning of, of our journey with providing ESG sustainability and impact solutions to our clients. I think in all cases, it, it starts with two things. One is understanding what matters to a client and what their objectives are. Understanding if they want to take certain factors into account or if they're looking for, you know, what are their balance of objectives across both financial goals and impact goals. I think it also comes down to an understanding of material ESG issues. And I think there's been real rigor, real evidence behind this over many years. We've done some really interesting work out of our Institute for Sustainable Investing here at Morgan Stanley, looking at the impacts that certain environmental, social, and governance factors have on investment outcomes. This is different factors are going to matter to different industry sectors. I think that particularly evident uh, in across all headlines is the impact of physical climate risks as an example. I think by not taking those, in, those pieces of information into account, you're leaving information on the table as, as an investment decision maker. And so again, not all E, S, and G factors that underpin different approaches to sustainable investing are going to matter in the same markets over the same time horizons and the same geographies but having a really un a deep understanding of how those factors play out in investment decisions is, is I think, critical and can be very beneficial to, um, to long-term financial performance. That's clearly aligned with, with fiduciary duty in many cases. So I think these are really important questions that are being asked. And I think there's a lot of nuance uh, within ESG investing that often gets lost in, in many headlines today, unfortunately. Okay, Courtney, another question, this one from Brian, and thank you for that. Can you talk about how Morgan Stanley approaches sustainability as an enterprise, i.e. its own carbon footprint versus managing investing in assets? Are both of these aspects contemplated in Morgan Stanley's $1 trillion commitment by 2030? Or is it just investment focused? That's a fantastic question. We really take a whole firm approach to sustainability. We realize that we can't talk the talk and not walk the walk. And so these are really important strategies and really uh, the mandate of our team in, in global sustainable finance at the firm wide level here at Morgan Stanley. We have multiple goals that tackle both sides of the equation. We've set a carbon neutrality goal that we'll meet by the end of this year in 2022. So that's really about our corporate carbon emissions footprint and our own corporate sustainability. So we tackle that very seriously and, and, it, and that is a, a, an explicit goal that we've set and we talk towards in our public reporting. The trillion dollar commitment that you've noted is a great one as well. This is really about how we mobilize capital towards solutions, whether those are financings for corporates or governments, whether that's capital allocated through our, our asset management business or wealth management division on behalf of our clients. It's about the capital we can mobilize through, through all of what we do as a global financial services firm. Um, we do also have a net zero finance emissions commitment by 2050. This is about our balance sheet lending and how we think about achieving net zero emissions within, again, the financing that, that we achieve. And so we have different goals that, that tackle different parts of our, uh, of, the, um, of our operations and of our, of our financing. It really, we really seek to bring kind of our best thinking to all of those and ensure that we're taking a consistent approach and, and bringing lessons learned across how we serve our clients and also how we're operating uh, ourselves as a global firm. Courtney, here's another question from Anna. I'd like to know how you will push the ESG agenda despite some local pushback. Yeah, I think this really comes down again to understanding what are the interests of our clients. This has really always been about, and as you can tell in the name of, you know, for example, out of our wealth management division, investing with right? This is really about helping our clients invest with the impact they would like to seek. So this is really providing the options for clients who really want to take this into account and also providing the full range of solutions for clients who, who, for whom this may not be a top consideration. I think that's really critical at the end of the day is that we're, we're committed to the, the firm-wide targets that we've set, again, net zero financed emissions, trillion dollar sustainable solutions by 2030, and, and our own carbon neutrality commitment by the end of this year. Um, but ensuring that we're providing solutions to clients wherever they may be in the sustainability or ESG topic or, or otherwise is really critical for us. Courtney, what would you tell to investors who really want to consider sustainable investing, or maybe they've uh, stuck their toe in it, but want to think a little bit more broadly, what are some of the moves that they should start taking? What specific actions um, to broaden the knowledge base and to actually think about changing a portfolio construction? It's a really good question and, and one that we've spent a lot of time on as well. I would always encourage clients to start or investors to start by identifying the issues that matter most to them. I think approaching ESG investing again as a broad concept can be overwhelming, but starting to think through what are the issues that matter most to you? Is it climate change? 
Is it di supporting diverse entrepreneurs? Is it about providing greater access to healthcare uh, for underserved communities? I think understanding what matters most to you as an investor and then taking a look at your current portfolio. I think before even approaching portfolio reconstruction, I think understanding and knowing what you own today is always an important first step. We've developed uh, you know, proprietary tools such as Morgan Stanley Impact Quotient within our own wealth business that help clients uh, achieve this. And there's many other tools as well, but I think really understanding what you own today and how it aligns with your particular goals, again, alongside and as you would do with your financial goal setting. And then from there, understanding the range of approaches that exist, right? Again, ESG investing is not one thing. You could exclude or avoid certain areas that, that may be problematic for a variety of reasons for you as an investor, or you may seek to lean into supporting solutions or, or corporates that have leading policies or practices again. Um, so I think there's a whole range of approaches and really understanding those as you go in to think about your portfolio are really key steps for, for any investor who's interested in this area. And Courtney, we have a question from Amit, and that has to do with sharing the level of integrity in measurement of your ESG data for portfolio companies. This is something that you and I talked a little bit about, and it's certainly come up before for investors. Um, is the data updated frequently? Is it current? How do you ensure there's no greenwashing done during the reporting? It's a really fantastic question. Again, we see the ESG data opportunity um, as both a challenge and an opportunity for us and for our clients. Largely speaking, at the corporate level, ESG data historically has often been an annual exercise that's reported through you know, company level reports. But we're really um, putting a lot of resources into understanding where this is all going. We're seeing a lot of um, standardization and regulations coming around ESG data and metrics reporting, which we think will only make the decision useful set of information in the market much more valuable to us and to our investors. Uh, we're seeking corporates report in other ways. Uh, we're seeing the emergence of new technologies like geospatial data, um, remote sensing technology, natural language processing, and AI to throw out a few buzzwords. But really, these are all truly innovative solutions that can help provide um, greater transparency, greater authenticity, and greater speed of some of these decision-making factors um, for individuals and, and for investors in the market. Again, whether those are about corporate policies, which are binary information that may move more slowly, or more rapidly moving data like you know consumer sentiment around companies um, and even emissions profiles right some of these all of the esg data moves at very different speeds um, so it's a really interesting and dynamic space and question that, that we're seeking to tackle but it's really all about getting back to transparency authenticity um, and and you know the ability to provide that decision useful information and Courtney, there's like a connection challenge when we talk about sustainable financing. How do we break down the silos when you go with ESG? I mean, a lot of it now is seems to be shifting uh, quite a bit. And in fact, you were talking about strategies that we wouldn't have even talked about five years ago. Exactly. I think when I first joined the firm, I think there's topics that we're tackling now that, that were not, um, you know, on, certainly on my radar at that time. And so it's a really rapidly evolving space. I think it's absolutely right. I think the, the silos between E, S, and G uh, are really unfortunate if they persist, because at the end of the day, despite all the noise and, and, and even newcomers to, to ESG, I think what we've been striving for for many years is to really build long-term sustainability, which is going to require an inclusive and equitable economy alongside one that's successfully transitioning to a lower carbon uh, economy as well. And so to achieve all of that and understand the intersections between inclusion and climate change the circular economy, biodiversity, and natural capital, I think there really needs to be a deep understanding and cross-pollination of ideas. And I think that's really where um, ESG and sustainability as a profession is, is quite interesting. I think when we address uh, our ability to understand both sides of the coin, even if clients come to us with a solution that may on its surface sound purely environmental, for example, we worked recently with the uh, with a great foundation that was bringing um, that helped issue a green bond for uh, family forest landholders and into the market that was going to support uh, the carbon markets. And so again, that's a, a climate issue, but providing capital markets access to, to family landholders, which actually are one of the larger uh, owners of forest lands in the U.S., providing them access to the capital markets in a way that they hadn't before is also a, a social solution in many cases. And so I think really understanding the interplay between environmental issues and social issues where they can be complementary, where in some cases there may be, um, you know, externalities that need to be considered as well, I think are really critical questions um, as we seek to achieve a, a longer term sustainable economy. I always love somebody who is so immersed in a topic like you are in sustainable finance. What's the most exciting thing happening right now, in your view, that maybe investors might not be aware of? 
It's a really good question. I think the extent to which that we can really embed really leading term scientific thinking into uh, sustainable finance, I think is a really key opportunity, whether that's, you know, researchers on the cutting edge of, of plastic waste solutions, whether that's data scientists on the cutting edge of, of climate transition and geospatial analytics. I think all of these things have an increasing role to play with our clients, with our uh, with investors for, for ourselves. I think ensuring that um, the authenticity of sustainability and ESG, it's always been a very interdisciplinary field, um, but maintaining a, a dialogue between kind of the, the on the ground experts and, and the financial markets, I think is gonna be really key. And there's only increasing opportunities to do that. And, and I think something that's personally very exciting to me in, in my role as well. We have a question from Paresh, uh, really just pointing out that a lot of cities are trying to position themselves as capital green finance. London, Paris, Hong Kong, Singapore. How important is that as a strategy to scale sustainable finance issuances and innovation? I think it's a really interesting question. I think a lot of great, uh, you know, a lot of great work comes out of, of communities of practice coming together and, and being located just a lot of events as part of the New York City Climate Week uh, just last month that happens alongside the UN General Assembly. And I think just the um, bringing, you know, actors together to have conversations uh, in real life, Zoom is great as well. Um, but as we have, you know, these great um, abilities to convene leaders and, and to operate in some of these ecosystems is great. I think there's also a risk that we overlook some of the, the other smaller um, cities, geographies that may not be a, a quote unquote kind of finance or capital center. Um, and I think there's a ton of innovation happening happening globally. And if it's you know middle of the U.S., um, other countries across the world, um, I think some of the you know huge solutions around uh, you know distributed energy and and circular economy are happening globally across the world. And so I think really understanding and connecting to those solutions and ensuring that there's not kind of siloed thinking in certain areas. Um, but again, I think the ability to bring communities of practice together. The different flavors regionally is, is going to be really key to ensuring that we're, we're learning lessons um, across across the globe. And Courtney, we've learned a lot from you here in this session. That is all the time we have. I want to thank you so much. Thanks as well to Morgan Stanley.